Thank you, Jeff. Right before we introduce folks, I'd like to ask a question. How many people, the show of hands, have read the National Preparedness Report of this past March? This past March, National Preparedness Report. Okay, I see about seven hands. It illustrates something very interesting. They have a paragraph on the bottom of page five. If you read nothing else, I would encourage you to read it. It talks about their worst case scenario. They don't tell you much about it, but they tell you two things, and I'd like to, you to think about it as you hear the next speakers. First, every local community should, and they define local community as an area with seven million people. So draw a circle anywhere in the country that holds seven million people, should be ready to handle 265,000 medical casualties. Now, if you think about any of the hospitals you know, you will not find an area of the country that would have more than 20,000 hospital beds. What do you do with the other 240,000 people? And the second thing this report says, and you must be prepared to do this with minimal assistance from the government. Why might that be? Um, they don't tell you why that might be. Uh, now, I know if I woke up in the morning in my city of Chicago, uh, was on the news because somebody detonated a 10 to, kil 10, to a little, 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 <laughs> a 10 to 20 kiloton weapon off the back of a pickup truck, and a quarter million people died, and a quarter million people got sick right away. As horrified as we would be, half the country would be coming running to their aid. We'd have to keep people out from because we love each other that much, and that's how we take care of each other in this country. So why isn't somebody able to come and take care of them? And I, and I don't know because the report doesn't tell me. I can only guess one thing. They're being very courageous and daring and introducing in a very quiet way some horrendous scenarios that politically are impossible to talk about, like these. Because there may be scenarios like that where all the caring, capable, wonderful people who want to come rushing to your aid just can't. So you have to be ready to take care of an extra 240,000 medical casualties on your own. And yet we haven't planned that. And we haven't exercised it, and we haven't trained for that, at least not to my knowledge. Now, to the great credit of the National Defense University and the Defense Department and a few others, a little over a year ago, the first time a comprehensive training uh, workshop and exercise was done at NDU with all of these folks involved and a broad range of federal, state, local government agencies, as well as the private sector, is the first time we looked at anything that might be a collapse of infrastructure nationwide that would last more than a month. And so uh, what I'd like to do now at this point is introduce the person who's going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lynn Wells. He's a fellow at National Defense University. Most of you would never know him. But I can tell you that I've never met a guy who would be brighter, broader in scope of understanding of issues in life, and more caring than he. And uh, with that, I thought he would be the most appropriate person I know to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Wells? Chuck. Chuck, thanks. Chuck, thanks. I may be very, very brief. Uh, Dr. Paul Stockton, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and America's Security Affairs, was confirmed by the Senate in 2009. As the Assistant Secretary, he is responsible for DOD, supervising DOD homeland um, defense activities, which includes defense critical infrastructure protection and mission assurance. The word mission assurance is very important activities. He does Defense Board of Civil Authorities, Defense Crisis Management, and Western Hemisphere Security Affairs. The rest of his bio you can read in the conference materials. Without further ado, let me introduce Secretary Stockton. It's a pleasure, sir. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for everything that you do at NDU to help lead the charge. Chuck, I'm enormously grateful to you and InfraGuard for the opportunity to speak today, but more important for the leadership that you're exercising this absolutely vital realm. So thanks to you, thanks to everybody in the room to make sure that this issue gets the prominence that it needs for policymakers, but also all of you building solution sets that are going to be viable, that are going to politically make sense. It's absolutely critical that we do that. And in that regard, uh, I want to apologize, Jeff, where are you? 
I, I cut into your time. That Ben study is extremely important. You know what I got out of it uh, most, and that is the need to think deeper about the finance side. It's not only a technical side, it's from a business case model. How do we get the financing that's going to be needed going forward? So thanks so much to you and all of your colleagues for that. I want to talk a little bit about how my portfolio has changed, how it applies to the problems of uh, infrastructure in general, and then EMP uh, preparedness, uh, solar uh, storm, geomagnetic disturbance preparedness, uh, all of those threat vectors that, that we're uh, together concerned with. I want to talk about uh, first response and then preparedness. I know that's a little backwards, but that's the way my brain works. And it works this way because we are in the midst now of our after action review from Hurricane Sandy. Folks, we suffered a strategic surprise in Hurricane Sandy. We did not understand, industry did not understand, the degree of fragility and especially interconnectivity between the power grid, the electric power grid, and the gas distribution system from the Colonial Pipeline to the Buckeye Pipeline, everything else. We were in discovery mode in the midst of a disaster. We had to build the airplane while flying it. What I mean there is that we had to build a concept of operations of how the Defense Logistics Agency was going to provide absolutely vital support for emergency power in order to save and sustain lives. So when you look at what that category of activity included, we were doing many things for the very first time. We had giant transport aircraft, C-5A aircraft, for the very first time in DOD history, loading up utility trucks, cherry pickers, in Southern California, in the state of Washington, in Phoenix, and flying them to the East Coast so Con Ed and other industry partners could make use of them for grid restoration. We had the Army Corps of Engineers, absolutely terrific folks working together with their contractors we had the Defense Logistics Agency supporting this effort to get emergency generators installed where they are most needed. And this comes as no surprise to you, but it surprised a lot of folks up in the disaster area that if you run your emergency power generator for more than 48 hours, guess what? They're not engineered for that. They're not maintained for that. They are going to break down. And so if we look at the kind of long-term disruption of the power grid that we could uh, experience due to the threat vectors that form the basis for this conference. We need to think about, okay, what is it going to take to bring capabilities in as part of the disaster response? What kinds of capabilities are going to be needed? Large-scale emergency uh, generators, power installation, and then above all, the flow of fuel. We we're providing fuel to six critical facilities for Verizon so they can maintain cell phone coverage in the New York metro area because guess what? They didn't have the plans in place to get the backup fuel they needed once their commercial providers could no longer execute that critical function. The interconnectivity of different components of the energy infrastructure, gas and electric, the cascading failure of critical infrastructure, starting with electricity and then moving down into communications and transportation. Folks, I'm going to ask all of you to think about what the effects will be, above all for life-saving and life-sustaining, if, due to EMP or geomagnetic disturbances, the grid goes down hard and we're back, I'm afraid, into discovery mode. I don't want that. I want to have thought about these factors, these common points of failure now, today, with your leadership to understand how, from my defense support to civil authorities perspective, how I can support DOE, how I can support FEMA and DHS so they, in turn, can help the nation's governors and mayors save and sustain lives. We're in a big after-action review uh, process here inside the Department of Defense. 
Later, we'll want to turn to our interagency partners. And ultimately, of course, the perspectives of industry are going to be absolutely vital. So for the very first time, I'm asking questions, shame on me for not having asked them before. Given the kinds of emergency management compacts and agreements that exist between utilities that they use against traditional threat vectors, where they come in and support each other, sometimes from considerable distances. Okay, how can the Department of Defense and our federal partners be prepared to support that for the kinds of events that you're discussing today, which could produce very, very long-term outages? What do we need to help support industry in a way that makes sense for the limited role of the federal government in these kinds of events? So there's a whole realm of disaster response that we're digging into. I think Sandy just gave us a taste, both of the nature of the response requirements that could emerge, and then the kinds of demand pull that would come on the Department of Defense, my personal interest, my personal responsibility. But how would that, again, be worked out in advance with industry as well as our federal partners. This is the new realm, I'm calling it the new dimension of defense support to civil authorities. And I'd ask you all to help me build out this new dimension. Understand it, be prepared for it, especially in the context of EMP and geomagnetic disturbances. Of course, cleaning up on aisle nine, doing the response, We'd like to avoid that. We'd like to do prevention and mitigation from the start so that the demand pull for this defense support, so the threat to human lives in these kinds of events is lessened before they occur. And that's an area where I think we need to continue to press forward. I think, uh, Jeff, some of the points that you made about continuing to strengthen policy guidance, build more coherence, and what kinds of things uh, we want from the, Depart from the Department of Defense perspective in terms of working together with our uh, lead federal partners, DOE and DHS, thinking about how we want to build partnerships with utilities so that we can make sure that critical defense facilities are able, again, my worm's eye view, execute the core DOD missions that the President is going to direct us to do, even if the grid goes down, even if the grid is disrupted due to geomagnetic disturbances or EMP. We need to be prepared for that. There are certain things that the Department of Defense can do inside its own uh, facilities, inside the fence line, if you will, but much, much more needs to be done in partnership with industry, knowing that the Department of Defense depends for 99% of its electric power on the commercial sector. There's only so much we can do inside the fence line. Much of what we need to be doing is in partnership with all of you in industry, with always, always the Department of Energy and the Department of Homeland Security in the lead for these partner activities, because they're in the lead for the federal government over issues related to critical infrastructure that's owned by uh, the private sector, and above all, energy infrastructure. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got our work cut out for us. On the other hand, again, there is progress being made. There are opportunities to build, for example, peaking power plants on DOD land in our, inside our installations that ordinarily would sell uh, uh, their power back to neighboring communities. The utilities would make a good return on, on investment. But if through the kinds of threats you're discussing here at this conference, the grid were to go down, then that would be a source of power to execute our critical missions in those facilities. There's all kinds of opportunities to make progress in partnership with industry that reflects the fact that industry needs to have some way of recovering costs for investment in resilience against these non-traditional threat vectors. Let's get rolling because, again, Sandy is proof that we need to accelerate our preparedness. And I'm as guilty of this as anybody else. In fact, shortly before Sandy struck, just a few weeks before Sandy struck, Congress had given us in the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act the authority for the first time to use our Title X reserves in responding to natural disasters. Really important authority. We finally got it. 
So during the course of this past hurricane season, we are pushing forward to try to get at least some interim measures so we can mobilize the reserves, bring them into the fight. And then around October, I said, okay, well, we're pretty well through this hurricane season. I guess we can turn to some other priorities, and we'll keep this one on. We'll keep it on a burner, but we'll kind of move it to the back burner, because hurricane season, it's winding down, isn't it? And then Sandy struck. Shame on me, but I think it's a metaphor for the need to sustain progress, to keep fighting, keep pushing against the resistant bureaucracy that sometimes we encounter. And I want to thank all of you for helping me do that, because you can lead, you can do things that's very difficult for us, those of us on the inside to be able to pull that off. And Chuck, in that regard, I want to thank you, all of your InfraGuard partners, uh, for helping lead the charge. Leadership is what's needed. You're providing that, Chuck. Thank you so much. And with that, I've kept my remarks very brief, so I can have your perceptions on what I should take back, your recommendations on what I should be doing within the Department of Defense in working with our lead partners, DOE and DHS, and above all, thinking about how in my own portfolio of mission assurance, that is ensuring the Department of Defense can execute its core missions even if the grid is threatened by these new vectors, we can ensure that we can do what the President wants. So with that, I'll open it up for any questions, any recommendations. I welcome that uh, very, very much. I have a microphone. And uh, come to me, and I'll meet you halfway. Is Dr. Wells still here? He could have a first question since he introduced you. And uh, then others can line up behind me. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Back in uh, the 90s with Presidential Decision Directive 63, the idea of information sharing and analysis centers and building this long-term partnership between government and industry has been, you know, very checkered success, and some success has done very well. Mm -hmm. What have we learned out of uh, Sandy and some other things that might allow us to do this better going forward in terms of the government industry partnership? Well, we've re relearned a lesson. I guess if you don't learn the lesson, it's not really a lesson learned. We relearned the lesson uh, that more sharing is going to be better, and that industry itself may not have the information that's required for us to be able to provide effective defense support. So there needs to be information gathering and information sharing. With one significant exception, the gas companies in the New York and New Jersey metro area could not tell us which gas stations had product but no electricity, or we could install generators to get that product pumped into vehicles, or Conversely, which gas stations had plenty of power but no gasoline, where we could truck the gasoline, fill it up, and again, they'd be good to go. We couldn't get that information out of industry because industry didn't have it. So we not only need better information sharing, but we need to gather the data. We need to understand which terminals for the distribution system, which connections in the gas distribution system need to be stood up in what order so that we can provide effective defense support. We need a better understanding of the data set, and then we need to share that data, and not by making things up in the, literally in the middle of the night, as I was doing during Sandy, but have a regularized flow of information, have plans in place so that when, not if, the next catastrophe strikes, and there is an energy dimension to that catastrophe, We'll be ready to go. Good afternoon, Secretary Stockton. I'm Shalom Flank. I'm the microgrid architect at Pareto Energy, a microgrid startup company here in D.C. Uh, you mentioned the importance of the financial and business side in order to be able to create a reliable power infrastructure for defense installations. But there seems to be a disconnect in current DOD policy. Uh, there are... Uh, new energy uh, installations going in uh, at a number of bases. Uh, for example, a 15 megawatt solar installation that we had done some work on where the energy is not usable by the base in the event of a grid outage. Uh, the necessary capability to make that energy usable takes a little extra money. The base has no budget authority to invest that increment in order to be able to use mm. the capability that's being installed. 
What do you think is the best way to overcome that barrier? Well, I think, uh, first of all, making sure that we are aware of the problem, as you're doing right now, that's absolutely vital. I have partners in the Department of Defense, uh, Sharon Burke uh, in operational energy, John Conger in installations and environment, uh, the Office of General Counsel, Bob Taylor. We're all working together very, very closely, really in an unprecedented way, to make sure that we understand what are the emerging problems, share best practices, share bad lessons learned, understand where gaps are. So from a DOD-wide perspective, we're able to bring this knowledge to bear and begin to make more progress than we've been made in the past. So we're getting better aligned inside the uh, Department of Defense, thanks, uh, thanks especially to John Conger and Sharon Burt for making that possible. We're getting better. We're going to be a better partner for you. So thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rosemary Orsini. I'm a retired DOD employee. Um, and now I'm a concerned citizen trying to see how um, I can help my community prepare. And I appreciate all the planning that you as a DOD uh, organization is doing to perform better in the next event. But have you considered the fact that um, most vehicles produced since 1979 won't even function then? And how will you accommodate that issue for DOD and the nation? Well, that is a, an enormous challenge, and it's one of many. We've got uh, legacy infrastructure and components of infrastructure, POVs, uh, trucks, etc., across the board that are not hardened against some of these threat factors. And so again, let's get going. Let's think uh, from a realistic way about what are the political impediments to progress and begin to take that on, knowing that there isn't going to be a huge amount of money that Congress is going to be able to appropriate against these problems in the current budget environment. That ain't going to happen. So in partnership with industry, in partnership with American citizens, what kinds of progress can we be making, again, with DOE, Department of Transportation, the other lead federal agencies helping to lead the charge with DOD and support. But there is a DOD internal component to that, which we take very, very seriously. That is, we need to be able to execute our missions from a continuity of operations perspective. We've got to be able to function in this environment, and we're paying plenty of attention to this and preparing against it. Thanks. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Andrea Bowen, State Representative from Maine. We met in London. Ah, I, thank you. I just had a, um, a brief suggestion, which would be to take your message on the road. I, mm. I've really been um, doing a lot of work in the Maine legislature to try to bring this um, awareness of this issue forward and um, bring some legislation to deal with it as far as the state can. Uh, so I, I really think there's an opportunity there to um, to address even state legislatures because, as you as was mentioned before, very very few people really have an awareness of what this uh, threat is. Thank you. Well, bless you for what you're doing because so much authority and responsibility does lie at the state level. And a few weeks ago, I went to the uh, national meeting of the. Uh, National Association of Regulate, Regulated Utility Commissioners, NARUC. Again, bad on me. I'd never heard of NARUC until I started digging deeper into this problem a year or two years ago and understood that regulatory authority for a lot of what we care about lies at the state level, not the federal level. And so if we're serious about cost recovery mechanisms that'll actually work for industry to build resilience against these new threat vectors, including cyber, we need to talk to utility commissioners about the importance from a national security perspective, from a DOD mission assurance perspective, of building the resilience of the capital investment that's necessary to do so on the part of utilities. Someone's got to pay for that. I'm not paying for it. DOD doesn't have money appropriated to us for that purpose. There has to be a commercial basis for making this progress, and I'm all about working with the states and utility commissioners to ensure that they understand our perspective 
on why building resilience against these kinds of threat vectors is so essential. And our last question. All right. uh, George Baker, and I, I was in to uh, brief your uh, uh, energy security working group recently, but I, I'm really pleased to see that you're uh, actually pursuing uh, building peaking plants on military bases. I think that's a great, uh, great initiative. I wondered if you're also looking at, at, at off the base at prioritizing the generation plants, the commercial generation plants, and maybe you know helping us you know uh, make the case for protecting. Uh, we can't protect them all, but protect the ones that are particularly important for national defense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important opportunity. I also think that as we look at mission assurance, building res redundance into uh, our supply uh, in an intelligent, informed way, and not having single points of failure for mission execution, really a systems engineering and a network theory understanding of what it takes for the Department of Defense to serve the people of this nation. That's a critical component, and as you've suggested, thinking from a big picture about which, kinds, which sources of energy are going to be most important to be able to access and how to be able to adapt, have some resilience in case some go down, to be able to execute from a, a load management perspective exactly what we need to be able to do and no more. That's a path I'd really enjoy walking uh, down with you and everybody in this room. Thanks. Assistant Secretary of Defense, Paul Stockton. On behalf of our group, I'd like to thank you for your personal investment of yourself and your office, bringing your attention and the nation's attention to this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chuck, and thanks to all of you.